anybody on here that for anyone on here that may not know me, uh, I'm Leah Boggs, and I'm in the Progressive Christianity Sunday School class at Central Christian and also a member of the Justice Team. Um, and I have also done some volunteer work with the Poor People's Campaign over the last several years. Um, and tonight is my great pleasure to introduce a panel to discuss both the Poor People's Campaign and the Third Reconstruction, which the Justice Team and others in the church have just finished reading. So with us tonight, we have Pam McMichael, the former executive director of the Highlander Center and one of the Kentucky Tri-Chairs of the Poor People's Campaign. Pam, if you want to raise your hand or wave your hand. Uh, she was also one of the national founders of Standing Up for Racial Justice. Uh, we have Reagan, <laughs> Reverend Megan Houston, pastor of First Christian Church in Bowling Green and one of the former Tri-Chairs of the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign and Dr. Arnold Farr, who's a professor at the University of Kentucky and a frontline participant in the Poor People's Campaign and the man I get my chicken eggs from, which are delicious. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Reverend Plummel to introduce the team and the topic. And we're just so very grateful to have all of you with us tonight. Let me just very quickly, get, let me add that I want to welcome all of you here too, particularly want to send, uh, extend a warm welcome to the panel members tonight. Let me take just a moment to introduce the people who are part of the Justice Ministry team and or have been working on this Let's, Let's All Read program. Uh, Vicki Batska, you can raise your kind of shake, yeah, raise your hand a little bit. Where, well, uh, Leah Boggs, Kurt Ehrman Trout. Connie Hubbard, Margetta McFarland, Brenda Peterson, who's not with us, myself, Steve Plymel, Phil Points, Deline Vastbinder, and John Zink. Those are the members of the, of the people who have helped pull all of this together. Uh, the panel members have been introduced to you, and we ask each one of them to take three to five minutes here at the beginning to talk about ways in which they have uh, been uh, interested in a way they got interested in the Poor People's Campaign and the kind of um, activities they have within the Poor People's Campaign. Just introduce yourself to us. And why don't we begin with uh, Reverend Houston. You're, you're mute. Uh, there you go. Hi, everybody. It feels like I am with a group of friends, even though there are some new faces. Um, it is just a real joy to be with you all tonight. Um, to our Central Christian folks, um, your pastor David is so special to me. Um, he is a mentor through the Bethany Fellows and without that organization and his leadership and mentorship, I could have never gotten to a place to have the courage to do something like the Poor People's Campaign. And so I just wanna say how much I um, am honored to be in the same space um, on a panel with him, but also um, with Pam and with Arnold, who have just taught me so much about justice work. Um, I uh, can't speak as much to what's happening with Poor People's Campaign right now, not because I'm not the biggest cheerleader, but because I'm a little more immersed in congregational life right now and raising my twin daughters. But to answer your question of how um, I got involved with the Poor People's Campaign, um, I was, uh, I had just had my twins who are five now, they were probably about six months old. And while I had graduated from the Bethany Fellows, they, they say you graduate, it's a, it's a program to um, support ministers in their four, first, I think it was five years then, now it's four years of ministry. Um, I had graduated and, um, but fortunately a group of us continued meeting yearly for an alumni group to just sort of support each other in ministry. And there's a part of our rhythm is a, a continuing ed day, one day of the week. And um, one of my friends in this group, there's 12 of us. I think we've been meeting together for 10 years now. Um, but one of them um, is from North Carolina and Reverend Barber is his mentor. And so he invited Reverend Barber um, to our retreat to spend a day with us. And that was the first time I met, I think Laurel was there and Reverend Barber came and um, I'm thinking of the voice of the movement now and I can't think of her name, but um, 
anyways, sitting at his feet. And also it was really important because I had been the senior minister here in Bowling Green for a few years. I was a new mom. Um, and he, he said to us, it, it was right in the wake of um, Donald Trump being elected as president also. And so it was sort of maybe the beginning of the political polarization that we have felt for a long time now and in our congregations we went around and we introduced ourselves and everybody started saying like, well, my congregation is like mostly Democrat or mostly Republican or 50, 50 or whatever. And, and he, at the end, he was so gracious. We were all like nervous to meet him, but he was so gracious. And he said, you know, I'm not here to tell you um, to talk about politics or to preach about politics. I'm just here to encourage you to talk about Jesus. And, um, he just, some of the things he said in that day, um, and, and I don't wanna to take too much of your time, but the things he said in that day and some events that happened in my congregation that told me they were ready um, and my urgency around if I was gonna leave my six month old twins every day to come to work, I said to my congregation, like it is going to count. It is gonna matter. We're gonna do ministry. Um, that matters and which isn't to say they weren't doing that before but there was no longer any room to uh, not do the thing I was called to and justice ministry has been a big part of my call for a long time so I'll stop there um, I could go on but thank you for having us thank you Megan for sharing that with us uh, Reverend Barber is a, a powerful personality to be sure uh, Dr. Farr can you tell us how you got involved with uh Poor People's Campaign. Yes, sir. So hello, everybody. And again, thank you for inviting us. I'm very excited to be um, speaking with you about this movement that is a great passion of mine. So I got involved, I guess it was, um, it was 2017. I was planning an event downtown in, in downtown Lexington. Um, we were approaching the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, during the 10th anniversary, the 40th anniversary, I'm sorry, 10 years prior, I was in Philadelphia and I had organized an event there in Philadelphia and invited as our speaker, um, Dr. James Cohn, who's the father of Black liberation theology. And um, so 10 years later, in 2017, I was planning an event for um, April 2018 to commemorate the 50th anniversary. And I was on Facebook with some friends and I was sort of putting some ideas out there and someone told me to, to, to uh, get in touch with Tana Fogel. I didn't really know Tana personally at the time, but we were somehow Facebook friends. And I reached out to her and she invited me to this event um, at her church, I believe it was, Total Grace. And I had no idea. She, she wanted me to come and speak on education. And um, I wasn't quite sure what the idea was about, but, but I knew it was connected to um, the Poor People's Campaign, which I didn't know a lot about at the time. I knew quite a bit about the, the movement as it was launched by King in the 60s, because uh, I actually taught classes on King when I was in Philadelphia. Um, so I, I, I spoke with Tana and she wanted me to be one of the speakers uh, at this program. And I discovered that this program was sort of the launching of the Poor People's Campaign in Lexington. And so I got involved that way and um, I learned more from her about what was going on. So I, I had the opportunity then to to go to some meetings in Frankfurt and meet wonderful people like, like Megan and, and Pam here. Um, and I think, uh, I think also that, that semester, that, that spring semester, um, Reverend Barbara and Liz Theo Harris came to visit um, Harlan, Kentucky. And we went down to spend some time with them in Harlan, Kentucky and had a great time. And we were in the process of planning um, six weeks of nonviolent moral fusion direct action uh, and our capital in Frankfurt. Um, so I got, that's how I got pulled in um, and got really involved. And of course, uh, Pam, Megan, and, and, and Leah, all of us were involved in some of the events that took place that spring um, in Frankfurt, where we even occupied the capital on um, one night. And then I, after the occupation, were banned from the capital. Um, but it was during that movement, I think that night that we occupied the capital, um, as we were marching through the halls of the capital singing, um, I've, been, I've been an activist of some sort my entire adult life. 
And I've always um, fought for liberation. I've always um, tried to bring attention to the, the least of these. And it dawned on me as we were marching through the hall singing that this is it. Um, this is probably uh, the most important thing outside of raising my children, probably the most important thing I've done with my adult life. Um, and I committed myself to the movement and I'll be a part of it until I'm dead and gone. I don't think the movement's gonna end. I think the movement's here to stay. And as long as I have breath, I'm gonna be a part of the movement because it really is, uh, we're doing what we're supposed to do. And for the first time in my life, being a part of this movement, I feel like I really found my groove in terms of what I'm supposed to be doing as a human being and what I'm supposed to be doing for other human beings. I have no doubt about that. Um, and so here we are several years later, still trying to bring pressure on our politicians. Um, it's a nonpartisan movement, right? Our, our job is to hold all politicians accountable for their actions, right? Um, if you make decisions that are gonna impact the lives of other people, you ought to be held accountable by the people. And so part of our work has been sort of reforming the false narrative that runs through our country, the false narrative about poverty and why people are in poverty. Uh, so part of the task is to take control of this false narrative and then educate people regarding the true narrative. Why are people in poverty? Why is there so much suffering in the richest country in the world, right? And people aren't poor by nature, right? It's a matter of policy. You can trace poverty back to various forms of policy that has been passed by our political leader, leaders. And so our job is to hold them accountable um, in any way possible. And I'll stop because I, again, I, as I said, this is one of my passions and I could talk forever about it. So I'll stop and, and let Pam have a turn. But thank you very much for having us. I look forward to um, the ongoing conversation. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. The connection of, uh, of liberation with this with this movement is, I think, a very important one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And Pam McMichael, let's turn to you. Uh, thank you. It's really good to be here with everybody tonight. Um, I, I um, just a little bit about how I grew up. I grew up um, in Anderson County, Kentucky, both um, out in the county and in a small town. So I've, I've lived all over the state. And um, um, and grew up uh, for transparency purposes, pur purposes, I'm a recovering Southern Baptist. Um, I, I, um, and so I grew up with some of those, uh, I never was hungry, but I grew up with a real clear sense of the have and have nots. And my parents through their factory work and uh, across the color line, their other work across the color line. So I had a very different experience about race than most eight, nine year olds in Anderson County, uh, you know, around. Uh, being in the homes of people of color and them being in mine. Um, so it took me a while to realize that at the same time I had these profound messages about treat people like you want to be treated and, and there's, you know, this great sense of neighbor help neighbor, that there were also when it comes to policy and voting, I come, you know, that, that just support for really mean policies that hurt people. And so um, I, um, um, where was I going with that? Um, so I, um, I feel like that one of the things I bring to the Poor People's Campaign um, is that having lived half of my life in rural areas and small towns, and, and then I moved to Louisville to go to grad school and stayed, except for my 12 years at Highlander. So just um, really hold those rural urban tensions and connections, and especially the way they play out in Kentucky, really uh, close to my heart. I meant to start a timer so I could track myself here because I'm from a long line of storytellers and I love to talk about the Poor People's Campaign. So cut me off, Stephen. Um, but I just, uh, I, when I was at, uh, Leah mentioned that I was at the director at the Highlander Center. And when I was there was the occasion to meet Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz. Uh, Highlander had a relationship with Union Seminary and the Moral Mondays that was happening in North Carolina. Uh, Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz, uh, for those who may not know, Highlander is known for having a round workshop center and people sit in rocking chairs to learn from each other. So I did have the opportunity be, to be with Reverend Barber in the, and Reverend Liz in those rocking chairs when they were talking about Moral Mondays and how to expand that movement and how to support that movement. And, um, and then so knew that this, that this uh, fifth, using the occasion of the 50 year anniversary to relaunch the Poor People's Campaign was coming. So then I retired and moved back to Louisville and, and we had a, 
we had a meeting uh, in Louisville with people from Kentucky and Tennessee and out of that meeting. And that's where I met there. You know, I have a lot of deep and long relationships in this state, but I met a lot of new people through that meeting to talk about the launch of the Poor People's Campaign across the country. And, you know, like Megan and Arnold, I just um, I just have a lot of um, uh, the, the main Christians have really had too much say in this country. And so there's such a critical role for the justice and, and, and people loving people of faith uh, to play in this country as we just see so much meanness and hate showing up in public policy. So, so there are many reasons why I'm drawn to this campaign, the, the interlocking pieces of systemic racism, poverty, war, the moral narrative, all that just really speaks to my heart. It speaks to my head and, um, and so I, and then, and then just those 40 days of action, the way uh, we got to know each other and bonded, it was sitting on that cold floor in the rotunda where I learned that Arnold Farr is a philosophy professor at UK and where I also got to hear more about Megan's, Megan's twins who were in strollers then. So it's, it's um, and where I also met Leah. And so the, so I'm, I'm in this campaign for similar reasons. I'm, 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 horrified about what's happening in our country. I'm horrified about the public policy and the way it hurts people. I have a lot of hope that a movement that lifts up faith and, and the stories of impacted people, the, the lives of impacted people that, um, and just, and also the way that we, what we do in Kentucky is in alignment with what's going on in other states. That gives me a lot of hope that two plus two adds up to more than four that it's that alignment with, with being, being with a um, you know, national leadership in other states that gives me hope that we can really build enough power to affect change. So I think, I'll, I think I'll stop right there. Well, thank you. Kind of responding to, to what you were talking about, let me ask the three of you, um, if you were speaking with someone who knew absolutely nothing about the Poor People's Campaign, how would you describe what it's all about? And how would you kind of summarize the intent or the purpose of the Poor People's Campaign? Megan, could we start with you? This is a quiz since I haven't been out talking about it for a couple of years. Um, I would, you know, I would say that the Poor People's Campaign is a movement that is, we call it a moral fusion movement because for so long we've been sort of advocating for the things that we might be passionate about, whether that's for the environment or racial justice um, or poverty, we've kind of been sometimes doing that in our silos and the poor people's campaign is an opportunity to come together across those um, injustices and um, to say, you know, there's power when we lift our voices and come together. And specifically, I think the most beautiful thing to me is Poor People's Campaign has put people in the room together who usually are not. I remember being at a, um, so, well, I won't, I won't go into that story, but um, I think to tell someone what the Poor People's Campaign is, I think we use, we call it, um, nope, don't have those words anymore either, um, <laughs> nonviolent civil disobedience, but we do direct actions where we might break a rule or break the law, but it's to bring attention to these issues. And we ultimately hope it will impact policy around racism, poverty, environmental degradation, the war economy, and um, the distorted moral narrative. Boom, I'm gonna pass it along to Pam okay, or pa Arnold. Pass that football over there to Arnold Farr and let's see what he can do with it. Yeah, so there's several ways, I mean, several approaches one might take in explaining the movement to people. Um, there's a historical, which connects it to the movement started by King in the late 60s. I'm not gonna do that one right now because I've done that many times, but if you want me to later, I will. <laughs> um, but the other approach is to sort of get people to think about where they are um, and, and, and people they know where those people are and the fairness of their situation. And I, I'll, 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 I'll do this by, by reflecting on something that happened in the Capitol when we occupied the rotunda that night. Pam, I don't know if it was you or Cindy sitting on the floor with me 
uh, we were sitting under that statue of, of Abraham Lincoln, I believe. And one of the state policemen, uh, they were all over the place. I guess extras came in that night because they didn't know what to expect. And they basically thought we were nuts. But one of them came over that night to talk to us and that's just what we were doing and why. And, and you could tell he saw thought we were, were nutty. Um, but um, I talked to him and he began to talk about his situation. And he's, he's a, a, a policeman, a, a officer, and that's a full-time job. But he also has another part-time job and his wife's a school teacher. And he began to talk about the fact that because he works as a police officer and has another part-time job, he doesn't get to spend time with his 14-year-old son. And I said, look, think about it. I said, think about your own situation. You have two jobs. Your wife's a teacher. And you're working two jobs. And the, the result of that is you can't spend time with your son. And he really needs more time with you growing up, right? But there's no reason for you to have to work two jobs. You have a full-time job as a police officer. Your wife has a full-time job as a teacher, right? There's no reason for you, the two of you, not to make enough money to take care of your family without you having to work a second job so that you can spend time with your son. He got it. He understood, right, when it was personalized. And I, at that time, I was running for city council, and um, I think that came out in the conversation. And as he was walking away, he turned and said, I'm going to vote for you, right? But, but my point, my point is that so many Americans are suffering. So many Americans are falling in poverty, right? Um, so many Americans are in situations that they know aren't right and aren't necessary, but they don't really, nothing really makes them think about it, right? So sort of, sort of getting them to think about where they are and people they love, the people they know, whom they love, right, are struggling, right? They have loved ones who, you know, when the, when the paycheck comes, you got to figure out, well, am I going to pay my electricity bill? Uh, am I going to buy insulin or am I going to buy food or am I going to pay for the kids' school, right? Um, if you are working full time, those ought not be questions, right? And at the same time, we're in a country where um, I think someone said we're, we're sort of becoming two different countries at the same time. We're becoming the richest country and the poorest country at the same time, right? The richest country because of the incredible amount of wealth that is concentrated in this country, the poorest because of the number of people who are falling into poverty, right? And people, more and more people are falling into poverty. The gap between the rich and, and poor is getting wider and wider. And that is happening regardless of what party, which party is in office, right? Um, so so that, that, I, I'll stop there. I, just sort of trying to get to where people are and, and get them to think about their own struggle or the struggles of people whom they know, right? And then getting them to see that, well, that struggle is not really you can't justify that. Something's wrong if you have to struggle uh, to that degree. Something's wrong if you have to work two jobs and the result of that is you can't spend time with your son. Okay, thanks for sharing that with us. That's, that's one of the key phrases I remember from gatherings uh, of the Poor People's Campaign is, that ain't right. That ain't right, yeah. That ain't right. Pam, what would you say to the question of how you would describe or explain Poor People's Campaign to someone who didn't know anything about it? Uh, you know, I think Arnold's point about how it comes up and what the entry points are is important. So depending on how we got into the conversation, um, you know, I try to say something general like, you know, it's a it's a it's a moral movement, a national movement to end poverty or racism. And then depending on what that response is, is where we go next. I also try to, you know, ask a question or, um, you know, to 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 frame it again in those moral issues like uh do, do, you, do you, you know, like is that we're about that it's not okay that a lot of issues are picked, uh, uh, put out as moral issues and particularly, you know, a lot of too many churches still talking about abortion and homosexuality, but not talking about is, you know, is, is it okay for children to go to bed hungry? Is it okay to put children in cages just, you know, because they come here from a different country? Is it okay to, um, um, for seniors to have to choose between food or medicine or rent and and not from a not trying not to from a challenging place but from a you know just like in a dialogue to try to just see where the entry points are and to ask some questions to get us to be able to talk about what the campaign's about okay uh, let, let, let's see if we can if we can focus it a little bit on specifics 
if these are the kind of things that the Poor People's Campaign is seeking to accomplish or working on, if, it, if these are descriptions of the Poor People's Campaign, then what's happening nationally and or here in Kentucky in order to address those issues? Uh, Pam, maybe we could begin with you on this one. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I think has been real important to our work, you know, national, national will put out, there's both the national leadership and the local flavor on those actions. Um, but one of the things that has been real important to us here in Kentucky is to be in coordination with those national actions. So with the 40 days of action, there was a national call to action to do the 40 days. We participated in that. We've also, you know, been a particularly important state because of the role of McConnell. So Kentucky got a lot of extra attention from Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz and national leadership. So there were extra, like we did truth and poverty tours. We did hearings. We've been really, all, you know, Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz have been to Kentucky about in 12 different locales. Uh, Louisville, Lexington, Benham, Northern Kentucky, Hazard, Corbin, Bowling Green a couple of times. Um, uh, so, so the, um, and, and, and the three kind of, the three overarching things that we're about, what we're trying to do is change the moral narrative. The 2016 election had both candidates, neither of which of any said the word poor. And so to change the narrative around poverty and change it to a moral narrative and to build power, to influence elections and policies. And so on that, sometimes people expect us to like, well, why isn't the Poor People's Campaign working on this? Or why isn't the Poor People's Campaign doing that? But if we can stay, and we feel like we have, the campaign has been successful in shifting the narrative. Our, our, our actions in Frankfurt weren't about being cool to get arrested. It was about what can we do to push the limit to get the press to talk about these issues. So we were able to do that without getting arrested. Um, for all our good trouble, you know, we ended up not with those civil disobedience arrests in Frankfurt. Um, and, it let, and, and, and there's some specific things coming up, but I'm not sure, Stephen, if that fits right here or you want me to wait on that a little bit. And I, um, am, I, am I on point about the question? Yeah, I, I, what, I, what I think we wanna hear is just exactly what the Poor People's Campaign is doing here in Kentucky and nationally to address these concerns uh, that, that the Poor People's Campaign expresses. Uh, Arnold, do you want to say anything? Can you add something to that? Yeah, so I think, as Pam pointed out, the important thing is the narrative is beginning to shift a little bit, right? Because we forced the media to talk about some of these issues and make them more visible. Um, and I think one of the most important things we do, too, is allow um, impacted people to tell their stories. We've held a number of events where we've invited um, politicians from both of the major parties, um, and they were to sit and listen to impacted people tell their stories. And um, during the last uh, gubernatorial election here in, in, in Kentucky, um, our present governor actually adopted some of the language of the Poor People's Campaign in a number of his speeches. When he, he would say things like, this is not about Republican or Democrat. Um, it's, it's not about left or right, it's about right and wrong. Uh, phrases like that and several others he actually adopted from uh, the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, so the word's getting out, people are listening, they're, they're rethinking the narrative. Um, and, and part of that, I mean, the, the media attention is very important. So the work in Frankfurt, as Pam pointed out, was actually draw public attention to the various problems that we talk about, like systemic racism, um, um, ecological devastation, poverty, racism, those kind of things. Um, and to, to be present always out there with the, with the real narrative, the true narrative, putting that out there, letting people pick that up, um, doing it here in Kentucky, uh, various counties in Kentucky, in Frankfurt, and going to DC, doing it in DC also, right? And so I think, um, again, this is, uh, as, as Barbara always says, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, um, and progress is always very slow. Uh, but I do think that we're making slow progress, at least at, right, right now, at the level of, of changing the narrative and getting people to realize that poverty is a moral issue. It, poverty is not a natural category, right? Um, it's not just a case that they're, they're just, they happen to be poor people, just like um, they're tall and short people, right? Um, poverty is something that is produced. 
And the task is to get people to understand uh, the ways in which poverty is produced through policy. And I think we're slowly, slowly having an impact and the movement's growing. More and more people are paying attention. Uh, more and more people are, are getting involved and I anticipate um, continue, uh, continued growth. Um, and as the, as the movement grows, uh, I think more and more of the narrative will begin to change and that will hopefully eventually impact policy. Now we've actually gone to, 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 um, to Frankfurt and DC with a list of demands and put, put that list in the hands of our politicians and say, look, you need to address this. There's an effort right now, I think, uh, I, you know, I don't remember the exact dates, but here in Kentucky, there's an effort to get some people lined up for bus trips to Washington for a uh, Poor People's Campaign rally there dealing with uh, voter rights. Yes, sir. Voting rights. Yes, sir. So you're right. Megan, uh, can you jump into this and, and uh, share with us some specific things that are going on? Sure. I, I want to say two things. Um, the first is um, to loop back to the question you asked before this, like, what is the Poor People's Campaign? Um, I just want to name, because I know a lot of our disciples' churches really showed up during our 40 days and have been showing up for Poor People's Campaign. And so I would just say, if you've shown up, like you are Poor People's Campaign, because part of this is um, people showing up and saying that these issues matter. And I know at the start of this, um, I, I don't know, I think it most of the time when God is calling me to something that matters, I'm half nervous that no one will show up and half nervous that everyone will show up. <laughs> and that's how we were starting this, right? Is we wanted to bring attention to these issues, um, but it really mattered that people showed up. And so um, for those of you who have stayed connected, um, that is how we move this forward. And then um, I wanted to just tell a story about, you know, how are we, you know, we say these are the things that we're about, how are we addressing them or changing policy? Um, and I don't know, uh, Pam and Arnold can correct me if I'm speaking out of turn here, but um, one of my favorite stories from the 40 days happened, I think it was right after the end of the 40 days. So at the beginning on the anniversary of Dr. King, the 50th anniversary of his death, we started doing a direct action every week for 40 days at the Capitol. And so we about second, the second week was when we spent the night in the Capitol. That's when they banned us from the Capitol. That's when we started getting a lot more media attention because that was not um, legal to say that citizens couldn't enter their own state Capitol. And that really sort of got some things moving and, and allowed us to sort of lift our voices on these issues a little bit more. So by the time the 40 days ended and na national, it was kind of like a time to take a breather, but here in Kentucky, we didn't get to totally take that breather because we still had some of the, um, the pressure of being banned from the Capitol and really a legal case around it. And so we had a press conference and I am probably getting these details wrong, but we had a press conference, I believe right after the 40 days and it was right around the time. I don't know if y'all remember a guy named Matt Bevan. He was our governor. And he had just said he was gonna take all dental and vision benefits away. Do y'all remember that from Medicaid, I believe? Am I getting those details right, Pam and Arnold? Okay, so he was about to do that. So we were having a press conference that I think was around addressing them kicking us out of the Capitol. And so we decided, we told everybody to bring their toothbrushes and we were gonna drop them in Matt Bevan's office. And so we went in and his poor little aides, his poor little administrators are taking these, like we just keep giving them toothbrushes, giving them toothbrushes, giving them toothbrushes. And they're like, what are we gonna do with these? You know, And we're like, don't take away dental from our kids, from people in poverty, from people who need it. You know, um, And it was like a week later that that was reversed. So I don't, I'm not saying that because of what you can't always measure was that poor people's campaign was that another organization that was organizing around this issue you can't exactly measure that um but i sure was glad that we did it so i i feel like that was something we did that felt like it had a significant impact okay, Stephen, if i could um i know i've had a turn on this question but i left out something real important we're doing right now and have been doing if i could have just a few more seconds on this question yeah sure 
Um, one of the things that we've worked a lot on is voting rights and restoration of voting rights. It, uh, because we see that as critical to building power and also critical to building the power to be able to affect these other issues. So uh, civic engagement, democratic participation, people educated and involved. Um, you know, a lot of times you see these big efforts and get out the vote and they don't pay attention to people other times. And it's like, or, but organized people vote. And so the and so with the the restoration of voting rights for people who've been formerly incarcerated, registration of poor people, we've put a lot into that. Like we might not, somebody might say, well, why isn't the poor people's campaign working on housing in Louisville? Well, the way we're working on some of these issues is by helping to build the power to actually impact them. And so that voting rights is just key to that. So voting, and when you look at the kind of overlay. Like there's there it, there was significant rural vote for there's certain counties. While this isn't a Democrat or Republican relation uh, situation, there are counties in Eastern Kentucky that voted for Bevin and Trump. So we need to know more about people and what relationships can we build in those counties, um, because the if more poor people vote, just a small percentage in different states across the country, we can definitely impact elections and, and policies that affect poor people. So that, that's that been a key part of our work in the last couple of years, particularly. We helped do election watch. Uh, we put some money into get out the vote areas uh, in Louisville, Lexington, and Paducah. Uh, we put resources behind, and it might not be like the, it, it might not be the poor people's campaign bus driving down the street with that but we were supporting people who already have those relationships to get out the vote and there are times also a lot you know like we have organizational partners and so somebody might be wearing somebody might be kentucky poor people's campaign they might be a kftc uh, member as well and if you have an organization that already has a structure and an apparatus like kftc that we can plug into then we're not trying to invent the wheel we're trying to add where we add our yeast that helps it you know, that helps support it. So I, I, I think I think in terms of answering the question, what are we doing right now? I missed that on the first round and it's, a, it's an important one to lift up. Okay, if how would you respond if I said to you, uh, to any one of the panel members, look, I, I, I'm sympathetic with a lot of these things, but there are so many problems, man, it's just completely overwhelming. There's more than I can possibly do. It is beyond my ability to make any kind of change whatsoever. So I, I don't know, maybe I should just forget about the whole thing and not worry about it. I'll jump in. Um, so two things, um, quite often, you know, when I'm, I, I'm giving lectures on race in various places, various universities, lectures on, on race. Um, I'll have someone come up and say, man, it's so bad. Um, people will never change um, or things will never change. And I have to point out to them, there has been change because if it had not been changed, I would not be in this room at this university giving a lecture, right? I would not be a professor at the University of Kentucky, right? Um, so there has been change, although we have to be also sensitive to um, the pushback when there is a little bit of change, right? So the first thing is to encourage people by letting them know that, yeah, there can be change and there has been some change, although there need to be more. Um, the second thing is people tend to think in terms of the big picture. You have to think in terms of the big picture sometimes, right? But that can be overwhelming, right? Uh, a lot of people, when they get involved in social justice work, they want, they want the revolution now, where everything has changed all of a sudden. And that's not going to happen. And so the way I approach this, and I, I try to encourage others too, um, is to simply ask, what kind of contribution can I make to social change, right? And, and that's not so overwhelming because at the end of the day, I think a person would be hard pressed to say they can't make any kind of contribution, right? Um, and because I get, I get questions like that quite a bit and, and whether it be from, from uh, just people in the public that I'm speaking with or even my students when they undergo some kind of transformation and they're interested in social justice, right? Um, just ask yourself, what kind of contribution can you make? Um, and, and try to make that contribution. Also, it's important to, um, uh, find community, people who have the same interests that you do in social justice, because quite often uh, what people are afraid of is being alone, right? 
when they when they take when you, when, you, when you fight for social justice, quite often you're taking a big step and you're stepping outside of a comfort zone, right? And um, you may have you might be a member of a particular community where uh, that's going to have negative implications. So you always have to try to make sure that you have community as you do this work too. So I th I, I stress um, having community and also asking yourself what kind of contribution can you make as opposed to saying we're going to transform everything at once. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Megan or Pam, you want to jump in on that? I can jump in from a faith perspective. I was just pulling up um, the scripture we're using for our stewardship theme is Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, uh, but not yet seen. And I think it's really important as people of faith um, that what we, you know, we are building for a future that we may not, uh, see, right. Like we're, we're working towards something that I hope. And again, like going back to when you said, you know, why did you get involved? It's because I want things to be different for my kids. And I, at the very least want them to know that I tried to make things different. Um, when it felt like the world was falling apart and, um, the other thing I was going to say, I've got the picture I have in my office. This is the uh, Freedom March in 1963. And it's all those people at the Washington Monument. And I think when I started Poor People's Campaign, when we were down in that basement in Louisville that Pam talked about, like, I thought that's what we're going to do, right? Like, it's going to be that. And so I think a lot of times we think to be a part of a movement means something instant and huge. And what I've learned is, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in one of the other questions that I saw you had, but I've learned that so much of the justice work is not the sexy out front public in the media. It's what we're doing right now. It's um, in a big church, in a old church basement, drinking stale coffee, um, really making sure you're going to know what you're doing before the media is there, before you put your body on the line. Um, so I say congregations need to be doing, I, I call it, there's basement work, there's worship work, and there, and then, and then there is public and prophetic work. And sometimes we want to skip those two. Um, sometimes we want to go straight to the public and prophetic, but it's real important we spend that time on the basement work and the worship work if we're communities of faith. Okay. Yeah, I, I, the, the, both of those are beautifully said, and I, Stephen, I would, yeah, beautifully said. So, I, I sometimes ask people when if they're wanting to do something and they're overwhelmed, I ask them what what touches your heart. Plug in some place that touches your heart. And so, and this piece about that it's basement work. It's and just Ann Braden used to say, uh, people know Ann Braden here in Louisville. Um, this fierce anti white woman, anti-racist activist. She said, I used to think that to, to Megan's point, she's already made the point. And, and Anne used to say that too. I used to, I used to think that being part of the movement meant I was going to be called on to give up my life. And I realized that it's, it's licking stamps. It's making phone calls. It's doing mailings. And so this piece about how can I contribute con contribution and community, I really love both of what Megan and uh, Arnold said. Thank you. So if if I say, well, yeah, that makes a, that makes some sense. What what specifically can I do? I mean, how can I even begin to get involved? Well, what are you good at? I think that would be the first thing we would ask you, right? <laughs> well, I don't think we have enough time for me to go over uh, everything I'm good at. So <laughs> I want to brag on Leah for a minute because I was so confused when Leah texted me from Central. I'm like, Leah's not from Central Christian Church. She's from the Poor People's Campaign. And I never knew that she was a disciple. She was just the sweaty lawyer sitting outside making sure that if we got arrested, somebody would bail us out. And so- um, It's your backpack carrier, right? <laughs> yeah, the, you carried the bail money, I think, you know? So, um, so my point is, you know, what can I do? Um, 
what's so beautiful about the poor people's campaign is you can enter data. If you want to enter data, you can make phone calls. You can get up and make a speech. If you're an impacted person, um, you can risk arrest or you can be support for people risking arrest. Um, we have medics at most of our events. Um, you know, there, if, as far as what you can do there, you can show up to an event and listen, and that makes an impact. I think for as many gifts as someone has, there is a place to plug into the campaign. So my first question in a conversation, kind of like Pam was saying, the, we, I think we would try to have a conversation would be, you know, what is it that sets your heart on fire? And we'll tell you how that might plug into the movement. Because some people, and that's what's so good is like, some people can't risk arrest, right? Or are, just aren't in that place, but you can still be an important part of the movement. If I may, thank you, Megan. That was so very sweet. And I was so honored to be your backpack carrier and sit outside in the sun and make sure you all had food and medicine and bail money and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think what I learned, you know, I learned that it's, it's the long haul, it's the planning, it's the basement work. You know, I think I, when I first heard about it, thought it was the Million Man March, you know, we were going to storm the Capitol. I, of course, couldn't storm the Capitol. <laughs> when you work for the Attorney General, they sort of frown on you storming the Capitol. So I, I had to find a place that I fit in, which, which I did. There are a lot of opportunities just to show up. There's a rally two o'clock, you show up, you're there, you listen, you clap. There's also a whole continuum of, you know, for the people that were really going to do the direct action, they had to be fed. They had to be, you know, there had to be packets made so they could put their belongings in them. There had to be transportation arranged. There had to be, there's all sorts of logistics that go along with it. My husband just said, you know, he, he stuffed packets for a campaign. He put dog treats in, in the campaign packets. Mm -hmm. You know, that had to be done. And, and that was something he could do. So there is always something, you know, show up when you hear there's an event and then ask somebody, what can I do next? And there's always some behind the scenes stamp licking that you can do. Um, there's some very specific, uh, beautiful, beautiful um, examples and experiences here. And in terms of like October 27th and going forward, um, I'd like to talk about some very specific things people can, can do based on some national calls to action. Is this a good place for that, Stephen? Sure, go right ahead. Yeah, so there, we're moving toward, well, today there was an emergency call to action about the Build Back Better plan because the Poor People's Campaign is calling attention to, there's no compromise on people's lives. There's no compromise. If we can find two, two trillion dollars to bail the airlines out, we can find the money, we have the money that it's not, it's not an issue of money, it's an issue of greed to not, you know, to not do this. So there was, we've got Kentucky Poor People's Campaign people in DC right now that were there today as part of that, uh, that action that happened today. And then moving forward, um, June 18th, 2022 is a National uh, Low Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington and all hands on deck toward it. So we've got a lot of work to do in Kentucky. There's, there's two new languages that the Poor People's Campaign are using and one is mobilizing captains. And this, there's an organizing toolkit that we'll be getting very soon with, certain, with specific mobilizing captains are gonna be people who are trying to help get like 25 people to this march. And there's some specific things that we'll be sharing out about that. Bases of operation, your committee or your church could be a base of operation. And that's where literature, why we're doing what this action is, why we're doing it, information about the Poor People's Campaign. We want all over Kentucky and churches, community centers, union halls, where if people walk by, they can pick up something and get information about this call to action. Again, why? We, we need to reconstitute, you know, we need all more hands on the coordinating committee. Uh, so we're going to be looking at that. We've got some some folks on the current coordinating committee who are running for office that influences, you know, how they relate to the coordinating committee. We've had some changes past, you know, Megan and uh, in, in her church, the work of her church and Pastor Don there in Lexington, who now is, you know, in a different role. So we're needing to expand and, and strengthen our coordinating committee. So there's also room 
you know, for for uh, a level of participation at that level. But so, coordinating committee, are you talking about Kentucky coordinating? Kentucky committee? coordinating committee. Yes, we meet. Uh, and and the other thing I know that you all have just done a study of the third reconstruction, and and we have we have known of different studies of the third the third reconstruction all over the state, but we haven't done one as a poor people's campaign. So in our last coordinating committee, we picked no, the middle of November as a time to launch this five weeks uh, series of studying the, you know, reading a couple of chapters and just said, whoever shows up, shows up. And then we're going to follow that in the, after the first of the year with Recry Justice. So there will, I'm sure there will be other calls to action. We'll be in a legislative session. There's, al uh, there's already a big lobby day scheduled in January. The Poor People's Campaign will relate to that. Um, so, so it's a both and, but we'll be, we'll really have our eyes on using this uh, organizing for the June 18th, 2022 as a way to strengthen current relationships and build new ones. And I think that's been, that's been part of our theme is all along in terms of when we do things, it's how do we strengthen our current relationships and build new ones and make, make space for people, you know, to, to do, because it's hard to relate to something if like, Keeping people involved is really key to building a base in Kentucky. So, and we and we can and we honestly um, have done a good job with that sometimes and need to do a better job with it others to be to be honest because you know we're a totally volunteer organization and and um, we've been really active and we we also um, hope moving forward that we do a better job of really you know, keeping keep connected to people who want to be engaged with this campaign. So who, when we get that organizing toolkit, should I send that to Leah? And she can, Leah, you could put it out to the rest of the committee. I'll be happy to. Let, let me, uh, I'm moving it a kind of a specific direction with, with one of the issues that has come up. Dr. Farr was talking about shifting the narrative uh and one of the we you know we had a reading of we we read through um the third reconstruction and we had a meeting where we were discussing that and broke into small groups and each of those small groups posed a question that should come before the panel this evening and one of the questions had to do with what is the lexicon used by the poor people's campaign representatives and others to reach people and get them engaged in the movement there are some terms that um, just carry a heck of a lot of weight. When we start talking about things like medical care for people, we always hear the criticism of socialism. So what, what, what kind of language, how can we change the narrative? And, and, and what kind of language do we need to avoid or what kind of language should we employ? Dr. Farr, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um... So I think it is important to sort of understand language and, and how language works. So I, I tend to run for office from time to time. And when I, when I do, people know, pretty much know my politics and where I stand. And so the term socialism does come up. And in 2018, I was running and a friend of mine wrote an article in the, in the paper in the, in the Herald Leader to support me. But in the paper, he said, I wish he would talk more about his socialism. And, it, and so another friend of mine calls me because he thinks that somebody trying to, to um, derail my campaign. And so no, he was a friend who was trying to help. But you know, when he said that, who, who was he talking to? Well, about five or six people here in Lexington who are um, members of DSA, right? And, and I've had conversations with people about that since. And for me, it's like, I don't, I don't like labels anyway, right? Um, because if somebody says you are X or Y or Z, first of all, I'm not sure how to define that term, right? And quite often the, the tendency is to put you in a box so they can beat up the box and not your real ideas, right? Um, and so I try to stay away from labels like that. And I focus on the issues. I always bring it back to the issues, right? And when people start the name game, I'm going to name it socialism or whatever. No, no, no. This is a real concrete issue right here in the United States of America. Right? Poverty is a real thing right here. And you can find it here. You can find it there. Right? It's in that community over there. And it's a real thing. Racism is a real thing right here. Um, 
explore the, explore the environment. That's a real thing, right? And so that, I always try to come back to the real concrete issue or problem and, and stay away from names, period, right? Because again, um, most often people use terms to derail what you're trying to do, right? And I think, I think there are enough examples, all of these problems that we talk about in the Poor People's Campaign, there are enough examples of those problems that you can sort of point to. And, and, and again, um, helping people think about their own lives or people whom they know, right? Why should it cost so much to, 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 uh, to get your medication, right? And you, you can say Canada socialist or whatever, but, but we have to think about why is it so much cheaper there, right, um, than it is here. And that's a real conversation to be had. And I would, I would, you know, try to always steer people back to the issues and the conversations and the concrete problems and stay away from the names. I know there's a ten, it's just hard to do because people want, they want to name things and they're hell bent on naming things. But I think we always have to resist that because names uh, uh, um, sort of, um, they cause us to focus, to, to lose focus on the issue. And I would always turn the focus back to the issue and try to avoid naming, right? Um, yeah, and, and so once you focus on the issues, right? Um, names and titles become irrelevant, it seems to me. I could get long-winded about that, but I'm trying to stop. <laughs> well, you are a professor after all. That's, yeah, we profess. <laughs> uh, Megan or Pam, can you jump in on that? Well, well uh, just briefly, I would say that that the language of moral, we're always there's a you know a commitment in the poor people's campaign to always bring, like for the longest time, we you almost always hear poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival. You hear the whole thing, uh, so that that moral narrative, changing the moral narrative, what is moral, really bringing that, and and like Arnold said, bringing it on the issues, and sometimes you know like. And, and encourage people to really study. Well, look, have you looked at the Jubilee policy platform? Really look at it and see what bothers you, uh, you know, like what, like, and, and those, that's also looking, you know, for your committee as a, something that people can do. We also suggest that really studying that Jubilee, the Poor People's Campaign Jubilee policy platform. I would also throw in here the Movement for Black Lives policy platform are really important concrete examples of a vision of what of, of, of how we could take care of our people in society. And so, um, so, you know, asking like if they're really serious about getting beyond the name calling level, just really look at what we're talking about asking, demanding and saying, holding up as a vision of how this society could function. And, and really ask yourself, if we do that, who wins and who loses? And, are, and in honesty, when I, if I'm, it, depending on if I've lost my patience in the conversation, I might say, well, what has capitalism done for you? <laughs> uh, Megan? The only, thing, the only thing I would add to that is, um, so I've noticed people are less likely to argue over an issue when rather than talking about the issue itself, um, you're listening to someone's story. And I think what I respect the most about what Poor People's Campaign has done is that no, you should notice always who has the mic, whose voice is being amplified. And so it's one thing to say, like, to put something in a box to get, I mean, I think the words we use are important. I'm not trying to say that they aren't, but I think we've been able to move past some of it because when someone is simply telling their story, um, it really moves people to a different place. And I've even been at a rally in DC where there was a, I think it was like a union organizer. There was somebody who was kind of high up who was supposed to speak for two minutes and started speaking for like 20 minutes or he didn't get that far. But Reverend Barber very respectfully said, I'm sorry, but we have to, you know, we have to move the mic to somebody else now. Um, and so just pay attention who has the mic. And I think that's the language that's most important. And often it's, it's people's stories. How do you, how do you three handle people who are adamantly opposed to some of the things that you say or some of the things that you do? 
people who just come on very mean-spirited with regard to you and the work that you're involved in. How, how do you handle that? We don't, I would say I don't. Um, we don't have to change everybody's mind. We have to change enough minds to change policy, to have a different kind of country, right? And so um, I think I, I'm, uh, I attended a class recently that was about uh, calling in the call out culture. And she talked about these circles of like, who are the influencers? Who is on the verge that you can kind of move to a certain place? And I think we have to recognize, in my opinion, um, I'm, not, I'm not speaking for the whole movement, but um, you know, if somebody is diametrically opposed to everything we say and do, our job isn't to convince them. Our job is to move the people that are willing to move and who, and we believe that. We believe we have the numbers of people who've experienced poverty or experienced racism or experienced these issues and are willing to change them. I want to second uh, what Megan said. Um, I'm a part of another group that's trying to bring change around another issue. And um, we're, we're working on fighting against a bill that they're trying to pass in Frankfurt. And we were, we had a meeting, I guess it was just last week. And um, we're, we're doing, again, a multiplicity of things, but some of us are writing op-eds for various newspapers across the state. And um, something came up about uh, um, the op-eds in certain counties might create more resistance and cause a problem for us. And we were trying to figure out how to deal with that. And um, one of the points I made was that, that uh, we're dealing with three groups of people here. We're dealing with people who take our position on this particular issue and want to do something about it. Um, and then there are those, our opponents who are writing this horrible bill that they want to pass. Um, and they're, they're supporters. And then there's a third group uh, of people who don't really know much about the issue and don't have a strong opinion either way, but they need to be, they need to be educated about the issue. And once they are properly educated about the issue, that third group will most likely um, become allies for us, right? Um, and so I think sort of trying to, trying to build on Megan's point, um, they're realizing you're not gonna convince everybody. I mean, some people like to argue just, just for the sake of argument. Right, they'll fight you all day long. Um, whereas the other people who um, might disagree, but but they they actually willing to listen and learn, and can possibly be moved along, right? And so I think conversations with those people are more fruitful than trying to convince somebody who's just sort of headstrong in their opposition to you. Uh, okay, that, that that's a good point, and part of what I'm interested in is is how do you stay grounded and uh, committed in the face of what we might call personal abuse, somebody attacking you? How do you stay calm? <laughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe two or three points quickly. One thing that keeps me grounded is I brought four human beings into the world. And um, going back to what Megan was saying earlier about leaving the world, at least trying to leave the world a better place for them, keeps me grounded and keeps me involved. Um, the other thing, in, in terms of personal attacks, that kind of thing, um, I don't get a lot of that, but, 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 but I've been in situations where there was some of that. Um, I, I just, I'm not that, bothered by it in a way. I mean, um, a lot of times when, when these personal attacks are hurled at us, to me, it's a sign of, of, of weakness on behalf of the other person, a sign of weakness and, and, and a sign of some kind of fear, right? Um, and it seems to me that when people go out of their way to attack us, that I take it as we're getting to them. I take it as we're getting to them. And, and for me, it's like, it, it gives me a positive vibe. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay, good. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. Pam, how do you stay grounded? Um, trying to remember why I'm there. 
uh, the Poor People's Campaign has an official 12 principles that the campaign is based on. We did a really good job. Uh, every action, we read those, we discussed them every time, uh, you know, those 40 days every week when the trainings, we still refer to them when we have gatherings. And that helps us keep grounded as a campaign. I, um, I try to remember, I don't know who taught me this politically, but I try to remember there are times that you respond to somebody and it might make you feel personally better in the moment, but it doesn't help move things forward. So I try to remember that and take a breath and say, is this really going to help move things forward? Um, and again, um, I think the thing that's, you know, a real, I mean, I Louisville was one of the epicenters of the resistance to the, uh, you know, uh, police killings last year with the Breonna Taylor murder. And so just really have um, experienced a lot of uh, watch stuff either on Facebook or in person uh, in terms of the attacks from people, attacks from police on protesters. And there's just, I think um, right now there's the, you think about what happened at our Capitol and, and on January 6th and, and just the, the, the spirit in the air that there's, um, you know, we, we were thankful and lucky in Frankfurt that w they didn't come at us in an organized way uh, in terms of uh, attacking us. Um, but there, you know, I think it's an important ta time for people individually and collectively to have each other's backs. Because it's, um, I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but it's, uh, it, you know, there's a, there's a real uh, escalation of hate and violence in our country. And so I think, um, I think staying grounded and have, and part of staying grounded is talking about the scenarios of what can happen and how to prepare for each one of those. And, and who, who, you know, how, how you collectively and individually have each other's backs. I hope that makes sense. It does, thank you. Let me see, uh, Dan, has anybody sent in questions via chat to you? I'll take no, that. I haven't seen any. Let me let me see if anyone has any questions you would like to raise. Uh, uh, something that you would like to have the panel discuss. If you do have a question, then you can send Dan a chat uh, message and he can read that question, or you can try to get the attention, my attention, and we'll 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 call on you to raise your question. I do have a question that I want to ask, and that is, uh, there is, you know, Reverend Barber talks a lot about uh, the money being poured into efforts to thwart just about everything that the Poor People's Campaign is seeking to work on or accomplish. And I, I know we've all heard about the dark money and politics and the way money influences uh, people who are making decisions, political decisions. What, how, what does the Poor People's Campaign, how does the Poor People's Campaign deal with that? Or does it see the scope of that problem as being massive? And is there a way to counter it? Or uh, how, how can we respond to all that dark money, for lack of a better term? Well, I think um, I'll be happy to hear what Megan and Pam have said about this. From my perspective, um, it, it doesn't impact our work directly. I mean, it goes into the hands of the, of the politicians um, and those whom we would like to uh, keep out of office because of the kind of policy they pass. But our focus is on, on, the, on the people and working through the people and giving voice to the people. And through impacted people, changing the narrative, right? Um, and, 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 and building the movement, right? By, by getting more and more impacted people involved. And as long as we, as long as the people still have voice and are magnifying their own visibility, um, I'm not so worried about the dark money. I mean, there's really nothing I can do about the money that, um, and he, I'm talking huge sums of money that people are giving to politicians. Our task is to go to movement and keep pressure on the politicians. And I think, I think we're doing a pretty good job doing that. Um, and so that's, that's my, reflection on that particular question. Okay, Pam or Megan? Yeah, 
Yeah, I would, I would, um, I, I would say that 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 building that 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 part of that influence of of the dark money comes out of us not having built enough power yet to counter that, and that and that the 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 focus on the people and building the movement and building the base in order to impact that 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 um, yeah that that I think that there are things that we can stop and do as we get get more powerfully uh, together in, in movement work. Um, it, it, I don't know, your, this question takes me to watching, um, there's, a, there's a video coming on PBS, I, I saw it, uh, a, a show of it, just the, you know, it's, it's dark money, but it's also what's happening with our government money. There's, a, there's an exposure, this video exposes these training, these training facilities in North Carolina that people apply in these rural communities for a gun permit and then they're they get these contracts to train the FBI and the and the police and then what's happening is they're training private civilians in guerrilla war tactics and so um this this these kinds of like and that's a that's that's a that's just so much wrong with that and so much scary about it so the the influence of 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 this the yeah just just we've got to continue like making the connections and mobilizing people and building enough power to get get you know get the control and i and we're in this shape because we don't quite have that yet is where i sit with that well numbers of people i think are very important i remember reverend barber saying at one time that two things make a real difference in politics and that is money and people. If you have a lot of money, it can make a difference. If you have a lot of people, it can make a difference. And while we may not be able to get a lot of money, we can get a lot of people. That is recruiting more people to be a part of it. But let yes, me definitely. Let me, let me uh, ask Megan. You you did a study with your congregation of um, the Third Reconstruction, and. What was the what was the follow up to that? What kind of follow up activities? What kind of reaction did people in the congregation have? Well, I think that was some of our basement slash worship work. So um, we did that in the fall of fifth. Girls were born in sixteen, so probably in the fall of sixteen because I forgot to show up to one of the book study nights because I still had twin new mom brain. And my mom called me and said, where are you? Which is not my personality type to miss a meeting like that. Anyways, um, so yes, it would have been fall of 16. Um, and we did the same study twice, um, but we were doing it with a sermon series called Jesus Friend Of which came out of meeting Reverend Barber when he said, don't, you know, just preach the gospel. You don't have to, you know, preach politics. And so a bunch of us in that group did this sermon series together. We did Jesus every week was a different friend. So like Jesus friend of women and telling the story of the woman at the well, Jesus friend of, um, I don't remember the word we used if we said foreigners or immigrants or refugees, um, Jesus friend of sinners, Jesus friend of children, Jesus friend of, I, I can't remember on and on, but um, again, that was our worship work um, to think about why these issues matter so that when, um, and some people got on board and some people didn't, um, but, you know, I, I guess I would say in the context of um, congregational ministry, what, what the Poor People's Campaign taught me is that especially in a disciples church where we've got folks coming from all different backgrounds and opinions. Um, I think for so long, I felt like I couldn't do justice work because it would make someone mad, right? And it's like, well, I don't agree with that. So you can't say it, you can't preach about it. Um, and what I learned through the course of the Poor People's Campaign and just through a lot of things that have happened here that have gotten us more involved in social justice work is that there's a lot of Christians, and I bet you guys on this call are among them if you're progressive Christians, who it is a central part of their faith to do justice work. 
And so um, someone defined to me three categories of people who help. Um, the first is helpers. And those are the ones that wanna give away food, tend the wounds of people who are hurting. The second is advocates. They might go a step further and take that person to a, you know, a, a, an appointment with a social worker or start getting them a little more help. And then third category is rebels. And I would say that's probably Pam and Arnold and I. <laughs> We're the ones that are willing to go out and we feel, and not just willing, like as a person of faith, this is a part of my call. And so it's really important that the church makes space for that in my call. And I don't say because I like working on policy issues that it's dumb that people are giving out food at the food bank. I don't think that's true, right? But that might not be my favorite way of helping. Um, so, which isn't totally untrue. I mean, like that's not truly true. I enjoy giving away food. I was doing it this morning. But, but the point is just because not everyone feels called to do work in this way as churches, we need to figure out how to make space for people to still do the work. So um, I know that you're asking more specifically what came out of it, but we did the book study and then, and then we got involved in the poor people's campaign. I mean, um, what the church can offer the movement is we're an institution and poor people's campaign isn't looking to be an institution. So when the church says we can drive our bus full of people to that protest, poor people's campaigns like, that is amazing. And when we're like, oh, heck, we'll even pay for some gas money. You know, things like that churches can do and can give support to movements because a movement isn't built to have its own bus. They're not trying to become a, an organization, right? And so um, anyways, I think doing the book study gave us permission to do some of the work. And also when we started doing some of the work, we lost some members, but we gained as many members and we're a different church because of it. Dave, may, may I ask Megan, was that um, first Christian in Bowling Green or was that, because um, you were at another church, right? Yes, I've been in this church the whole time of this movement work. Okay. I, I was at First Christian in Paris, Tennessee for four years, but I started here in January of 2013. Okay. Do you, do you think about doing the study again, like periodically? The third reconstruction? Well, now I kind of want to promote the one now that I hear they're doing it in November. I kind of would like to get some of my people to sign up for that. Um, yeah, I don't know. But I think joining with the Poor People's Campaign one would actually be a great way for the church to jump in. And Megan, did correct me, did, didn't you do it also with Pat, you and Pastor Je Lee's church, do it together we one time? We did. So we've yeah, kind of three just, different groups. Please so. talk about that. That is so important. Yeah. So we, um, in this, well, that would have been down in by 18, um, Reverend Lee. So we have a partnership with a local African-American congregation actually through poor people's campaign. Cause when I decided to start doing this work and mobilizing, um, folks in Bowling Green, I felt like if I was going to be doing it with integrity, I needed someone, um, from the African-American community to be doing it with me. Um, and Reverend Lee was the only pastor that didn't get up and leave as soon as I said, we might get arrested <laughs> together. So we became friends pretty quick, but um, our churches have become friends. In fact, I was giving away food with one of his deacons today and got to give him a big hug for the first time in a couple of years. And um, so we studied the book together. Um, he asked me to come do the book at their Tuesday night Bible study to just, he, um, talk a little bit about social justice, why we're doing the work. And then as it happened, so we were doing, and again, so we were doing that study. We were also doing a building bridges series together. So we did an Ash Wednesday service together and shared a meal. And then we um, did a pulpit, like I went and preached there. He went and preached, came and preached here. Um, and then it just so happened, Reverend Barber got to come to Bowling Green that spring. It, it all kind of built, um, we had a lot of movement work building then, but um, we organized an event here in Bowling Green where we, um, it was part of Poor People's Campaign, but then we followed it up with a listening session just in Bowling Green to talk about, um, you know, what community needs were, and that was really important. 
how can how can churches or people within a church form fusion connections with people who are outside of the church? Oh, I love answering this question. I'll try to go quick. quick. I thought you'd never ask. Okay. So <laughs> I think that you start with relationships and that's again, the basement and the uh, worship work. So um, part of the reason that I was able to say yes to the call to poor people's campaign is because also happening in 16, um, while I was pregnant with the girls, um, one of my church members said, there is a growing divide between people who are Christian and people who are Muslim. And there's a big Muslim community in Bowling Green. And he said, we have to get these people together in the same room to learn about Islam and to understand it's not all the things that people are saying that it is. And um, I was pregnant and didn't want to do it. I was tired, <laughs> but my lay person who was an elder kept pushing, kept pushing. So we did it. So we did a three week series with the Islamic Center where they taught us about their faith. Okay, fast forward a year later. So, so we got to know them. Fast forward a year later, we said, let's have a potluck together and just build our, that relationship again. One year later was when there was a travel ban um, that happened right at the beginning of the Trump presidency. And a group of people in Bowling Green from the Islamic Center, from the International Center, which helps us relocate refugees. And from one other organization said, we wanna have a unity march in Bowling Green to say like, we support refugees. We support people who are Muslim. Um, we are a united community. And then my colleague down at the Episcopal church was like, I'm new here. I don't really think we should start a controversial event at my church. Let's start it at your church. And so, um, so I, when I, t I talked to my board about it, there was not full consensus, but there was enough support from the board um, to go ahead. And I thought a couple people would show up. We had 800 people show up. It was the most people I've ever seen in our fellowship hall. It, it just so happened the week before was the Bowling Green massacre. So we had all this media attention um, that same week. But um, I, I want to say that story because so the relationships are so, so, so important because once they weren't someone else, they were people who we sat at tables with in our church. When they came to us and said, will you march with us? How could we say no, right? But if we didn't have that relationship, it would be, again, this might go back to the wording, it would be an issue. It would be a political issue, but this was just about walking with our neighbors, um, and so I think any opportunity to be in the same space. So our partnership with Mount Zion is so important because we want to bring people together in the same room who um, aren't always in the same room. So that way, um, when someone said, you know, when Reverend Lee called me after George Floyd was killed, what was I going to say? What do you need? How can we stand with you? Right. Um, and so I just think any opportunity to build those relationships. And again, it's not sexy, it's not exciting. It's just the, the background work of just building those relationships. And, you, and I also talk about um, this last thing I say, I know we're running out of time, um, proactive versus reactive social justice work. So the church has so many opportunities to do these proactive things so that when the next big thing comes up, it's not gonna be a fight about how you react to it. It's just gonna be, these are our people. How do they need us right now? So I'm very passionate on this topic. I'm glad you share that passion with us. Let me see if uh, we are running out of time. So let me turn to Pam and then Arnold and see if you have uh, a response to what Megan has been saying or some final words for us. Well, I just love what she said about uh, you don't have, you've, you've already built the relationship. So you don't have the argument because you know, these are our people. And, and, and it's sometimes it takes putting yourself in a different place. Um, sometimes, particularly as white people, we stay in the same place and want people to come to us. And sometimes it means putting ourselves in a different place to build those new relationships. Yeah, so that question, I'm, I'm glad Megan took it because it was a hard one for me. It's a hard one for me because, um, you know, I was raised in the church and my, I have a family full of ministers, my grandfather, uncles, cousins, my dad's a minister. And I was one too, years ago, over 30 years ago, and I actually went to seminary in Louisville. And it was there I fell from grace. 
and left the seminary and left the church. Um, <laughs> and that, that didn't go so well with seminary authorities nor my family. Um, and so I've remained unchurched for a good 30 years or so. Um, but, but two things happened to me around 2018. Um, one is I went to here, I was invited to a church here in Lexington um, for, I can't remember the event now, but, but, but um, uh, Leah Shade, a friend of mine uh, who's a minister here in town, preached that night. And she gave an excellent environmentalist sermon that really made me think in a different way about some things. And around the same time, I was beginning to get involved with the Poor People's Campaign. And I found myself surrounded by people of faith who were doing the very thing that I left the church for not doing, right? Um, and so I left the church out of frustration because there was nothing there for me as a person who was in interested in social justice and, and social transformation. Um, and so uh, in the last several years, since 2018, I've visited churches here or there. Um, I actually attended your church a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago with Miss Virginia Bell. Um, who invited me and I'll probably be back sometime. And so I've been opening space in my mind for thinking more about social justice work and my relationship to the church. But I did leave over 30 years ago because the churches that I, I was involved in at that time wasn't doing the kind of work that I thought the churches should be doing. And so this is probably the other end here where um, uh, I think in, in some cases the churches are losing people because there's a lack of social justice work. Um, and I was one of those that was lost over 30 years ago. Um, but now having been a part of the Poor People's Campaign and, and, and working with closely with people of faith like Megan and, and, and going to churches like your church and discovering more and more uh, people who are people of faith who are committed to social justice, um, I've changed my position on some things as, as a result of that. Um, so that's where I am. That's why I'm glad Megan took the question first. Uh, so. <laughs> Well, we really do appreciate you sharing that with us. And we want you to know that, that you're always welcome at Central. Always Thank welcome you. to have you there. Well, glad to have you there. Connie, do you have anything you want to say at the very end here? Just that I can't say enough thank you on behalf of all of us here. Um, just your time, your attention to sharing your story and your stories, which help us and can change how we look at things. So I'm excited for this group to expand what we do and how we do it. Um, so I just, I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for having us. I really enjoyed uh, we, it. Uh, Megan, Pam, Arnold, we cannot thank you enough for being with us. We do want to honor the time. It is 8.30 and we need to come to a conclusion. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, guys. Go in peace. Thank you all. Yes.